السلام علیکم I am going to introduce Dr. Zulfiqar Ali Shah because he is our first speaker today. Uh, Dr. Zulfiqar Ali Shah earned his uh, bachelor's and his master's from International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan in Islamic studies. Uh, he earned his doctorate from University of Wales in comparative religion. And he has taught uh, in um, Inter at International Islamic University, also at University of Wales, and s several institutes in the United States. Uh, he has served as the president of uh, Islamic Circle of North America and as imam in several Muslim communities in the United States. He is currently the imam at the Islamic Center of Milwaukee. Uh, Dr. Zulfiqar Ali Shah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim My respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, peace be unto you. The question, was Jesus a Muslim? can be addressed from different dimensions. All of us, we know that Christianity claims to be the religion of, or at least about, Jesus. So our first question is, was Jesus a Christian? And I would say that Christ is a Greek word for Christ, which is anointed one, Messiah. The Hebrew word Messiah or the Aramic word Messiah is translated into Greek as the Christos. So Christ could not be the name of Jesus, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. It cannot be a word of the Hebrew or the Aramic. So it must have come when Christianity became popular or part of the Hellenized world. So definitely the word Christian, and maybe Dr. Schrodinger will say, that even in the gospel usage of the word, in the beginning it was not a positive term. It was used as a kind of negative term for those who follow Christos. So briefly I would say, at least Jesus himself was not Christian. Yes, Christianity is religion about him, a reaction to him, to his teaching, so his own identity could not be Christian. What was his real identity? It's a very difficult question because we do not have the first-hand autographed material, written material from Jesus himself. What we have got is what we call nowadays the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have got four Gospels and none of them are authorized either by Jesus or autographed by Jesus at least. So gospel according to Matthew, or according to Luke, or according to Mark or John, they talk about Jesus' mission, about Jesus' ministry, but it's going to be very tough for anybody to say that 100% they give, say for example, historical or objective information about Jesus. Comes the epistles of Paul, which are the second largest corpus in the New Testament, again, St. Paul has not physically seen Jesus. So historically, one cannot say that Paul's letters are reflection upon historical Jesus. Now, the question comes to us, we have to kind of do reconstruction. Now, if you look back to the language itself, Jesus must have been born into a Jewish family. 
because Torah or religious people of that time had what they call the Hebrew language as the official religious language. And we are also told that Jesus himself spoke Aramaic, which is kind of either expansion, extension, or a colloquial, you can say, part of, you can say, the development of Hebrew. And I would like to now say what I said this morning, that the word shalom, shalom in Hebrew language means salam, peace. Even nowadays, our Jewish brothers and sisters, when they want to greet each other, they say shalom. And those who are, say for example, more educated into Hebrew, they will say shalom aleichum. Even if you go nowadays to some of the Palestinian towns in Palestine, they pronounce cha instead of saying salamu alaikum, they say salam alaychum, chif halach. So there is what we call the colloquial way of pronouncing ka, cha, or say for example kha. So if shalom is the word for peace, those people who are the people of peace, Hebrew language or Hebrew Bible, which is Torah, or you can call the Old Testament nowadays, use the word mishlam or mishlom for those people who are peacemaker or the people of peace. So therefore, if the religion itself or the I would say one of the very in important concepts in the Hebrew Bible is Shalom. And the person of peace is called Mishlam. Then Jesus would have been somewhere closer to this term because that would have been his identity. So I am inclined towards this kind of theory, you can say it, that possibly he might have been calling himself Mishlam in the Judaic understanding of the word, Hebrew understanding of the word. But again, as I've said, this is understanding. So what is Islam and what is Mishlam or what is Muslim? Islam has got two meanings. Shalom has got same meanings. Islam means submission and Islam means peace. Submission is the vertical dimension of the word Islam and peace is the horizontal dimension of Islam. Submission man to God, that designate the relationship between man and God. When it comes to God and man, Islam means submission to the moral will of God. When it comes to peace, it determines the horizontal relationship between man and man. So what is the moral will of God? It's exactly what God has revealed to Moses, to Abraham, to Jesus, to Muhammad, all of them. Do not kill, do not cheat, do not steal, do not bear false witness. So moral will is the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments are exactly the same, you can call it in the book of Deuteronomy, which is the Hebrew Bible, or in Torah. Jesus has repeated it in his Sermon on the Mount, and the Quran has repeated it in the Quran itself. So Quran has got the Ten Commandments. So what happens is that following those commandments is submission to the moral will of God. Anybody who follows those commandments, does not cheat, does not lie, does not kill, does not steal, is definitely going to be having peace because no authorities will run after him, no police will come after him, nobody will basically blame him or accuse him. So there is going to be definitely translating into peace in the neighborhood, 
peace in the society at large. So when I am talking about Islam or translating the word Islam or Muslim, I'm talking in those universal terms which basically bring in the concept of submission to the moral will of God and peace in the society. Now, I'll come to the question whether Jesus was a Muslim like the Muslims of today. Was Jesus a Muslim like the Muslims of 5th century, which is Islamic 5th century, 6th century, 7th century? I would have to answer that maybe partially, not exactly. And I can definitely say that he was not a Muslim like the Muslims of today. <laughs> so what does that mean? Because all of us we know that Islam is the name of a phenomenon. It's not the name of a tribe or a person. Those people who follow that phenomenon are Muslims in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now those people who will follow this phenomena partially, they may be called Muslims partially. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu dhkulu fi silmi kaafa wa la tattabiyu khutubat shaitan innahu lakum aduvum mubin. O you the believers, enter into Islam, enter into security with your totality. And Quran also tells us, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْدِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْدِ Do not divide the book into pieces. Do not cause departmentalization in religion that you follow some rules and you do not follow the others. So don't take a scissor and cut the Quran into pieces and say, I like this one, I will follow. And I do not like this one, I will never follow. And this one is against my freedom. If something comes from God, then that is what we are supposed to be following. And this is what is also what the Quran tells us. إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِي لِيَحْكُمُ بَيْنُهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا that the sign of Iman is that whenever people are called towards Allah and towards His Prophet and whenever they are told that take Allah and His Rasul as the Hakim لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ What is their answer? Their answer is سَمِعْنَا We listen and we obey. No if and but. So therefore, Islam is that phenomena which will follow the moral will of Allah, God, and in that issue will have the total submission and it must translate into peace and whatever we are going to talk about the Quranic message right now. The Quranic message, if somebody will ask me to summarize what does Quran stand for? What does Islam stand for? I will say Islam stands for what Allah or God Almighty stands for. We are told that Allah is justice and justice is Allah. This is what the Quran says. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kunu qawwameena bil qisti shuhada alillah. O the believers, Stand up for justice, witnessing for Allah. In the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, kunu qawwameena bil qisti shuhada alillah. O people stand up for justice, witnessing for Allah. Which means, one time justice is used and witness is towards Allah. The second time, stand up for Allah, witnessing justice. So therefore, the Muslim exegetes or Muslim uh, Mufassirin, they have said, Allah and justice are the alternate to each other. And that point is clear from the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. He is Al-Adl. He is the justice. He is Adil. So, and then the Quran tells us, 
as the Imam just recited the ayah from Surah Al-Hadid, لَكَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ That we have sent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have sent the prophets and revealed the scriptures so that people can establish justice. So if Allah himself is justice, if he has sent the prophets and the book which is Quran or Torah or Injil so that people establish the justice, then justice is the theme which runs throughout the Quran, which runs throughout the Islamic message. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left the issue of justice and how to establish it upon the whims and desires of the individuals or the believers. He has defined how to establish justice within family, within social system, within political system, within financial system, and then he keeps on reminding all the believers, sometimes calling upon the entire humanity with the titles of Ya Yuhannas, sometimes directly to the Muslims with the titles of Ya Yuhallazina Amanu, O you the believers. So the Quran is inviting the Muslim as well as the non-Muslim community towards the issues of justice, equality, and goes against discrimination or inequality based upon any standards, whether religious, origin, gender, you name it. Now, sometimes people, they when they look at the Quran, and sometimes especially our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, when they look at the Quran, they feel Quran is intruding human privacy too much. It's got too much within us. If you want to marry, marry this way. If you want to divorce, divorce this way. If you want to have children, do such and such kind of things to the children. Do this much to the parents. If you want to earn, earn this way. If you have to spend, spend this way. So sometimes people feel that the Quran or Islam is interfering in every aspect of my life. Where is my freedom? I want to, free, to be free in the world, to do whatever I want to. And I do not want a watching God sitting over me, telling me, do this one and don't do this one. But the problem is that we are driven by our desires, by our likes and dislikes. And sometimes we are blinded with those desires. When we want to get something, we somehow do not know the limits. So therefore, Quran, Quranic introduction of laws, Sharia laws, family laws, financial laws, political laws, they are not meant to make our life miserable or to interfere in every aspect of our life. These are the guidance given by God, the generic principles, to guarantee that we establish justice within family, justice within the community, justice in our financial system, justice in our political system. And unfortunately, whenever those Quranic principles or divine values are not followed or implemented, then it leads to lack of justice. The Quranic word is mizan, that there should be balance. As there is balance in the universe, there must be balance between spirituality and materialism between personal agendas and communal or collective agendas, between whatever you call capitalism and socialism, I would say. So balance is what is impossible for human beings if they do not have a neutral divine guidance coming to them and telling them, do this one and don't do this one. So therefore, as long as there is balance, human beings are not too individualistic or not communal. 
not too much materialistic, not too much spiritualistic, the not too much legalist, not too much ritualistic, the balance between that, it's fine. But whenever anybody will try to go this extreme or that extreme, the reminder comes from God, don't do it, this is not appropriate. Now there is another concept which I want you to understand from the Quranic concept which is the concept of ma'roof. If you look on the issues which the Quran has given us about divorce, excuse me, marriage, financial relationship, every aspect of Islam, Quran keeps on saying bil ma'roof, bil ma'roof. When you get married, you give them their mahar or sadaq with ma'roof. When you divorce, then don't basically what? Keep them as prisoners at home. Either you keep them as your wife or basically divorce them or separate yourself, but do everything bil ma'roof. This concept of maruf is that whatever is known in your area, whatever is acceptable as good in your society. So the maruf of the society of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him could be very different than the maruf of society in Pakistan. The maruf of society in Pakistan could be very different than the maruf of society you and me are living here in America. So therefore, after giving the generic principle, the Quran or Islam leaves some room for us to determine how we want to implement that justice in our present life. So therefore, I would say that if somebody has to define Islam from the Quranic perspective, it must be defined from the perspective of number one, Adil, justice, Number two, ma'roof. Number three, that basically a person works towards the realization of equality of humanity because all of us are the creation of same God. And he has told us in the Quran that Ya yunna suttaku rabbakum alladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a O oh people, fear Allah, have God consciousness who created you from one person. And actually in other ayah, Ya yuan nasu inna khalaknaakum min zakarim wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa kaba'ila li ta'arafu. O human beings, we created you from one father and one mother, Adam and Eve, and then distributed you into tribes and nations so that you can recognize each other and not to despise each other. And what is the golden principle of the Quran? Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. The noblest in the sight of Allah among all of you is the one who is more righteous. So righteousness is the yardstick of nobility in the sight of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, human dignity, human equality, distribution of resources, mutual sense of caring and sharing, compassionate, you just name it, all of those are the attributes which are essential for a Muslim as individual, for a Muslim society, and the world which is what the object of Islamic religion or Muslim religion. So if we define Islam in those ethical, moral, and universal terms, I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus was definitely a Muslim. Where I had my, you know, as I've just mentioned, that maybe that was the name itself. Where I really believe that he must have been even Muslim by name because that is the terminology used for the righteous people of his time in what we call the books which he has followed, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. But here I have no doubt in my mind 
that by actions, Jesus was a Muslim, a Muslim of justice, a Muslim who believes in equality, a Muslim who is working towards establishing or reforming the existent society so that it can live up to the values of compassion, respect, mutual sense of caring and sharing. And with all honesty, this is the Jesus portrayed by majority of the verses of also the New Testament. Whether the Gospel of Matthew or Luke or Mark, there's not much emphasis upon, emphasis upon the deity of Jesus, the Trinity, the original sin, or the other concepts which are very much prevalent in the Christian history of dogma or even which are emphasized nowadays by many known Christians. But the issue of the poor, the meek, the people who are suffering, the sick, the captives, this is highlighted in almost every page of the Gospel, especially the first three Gospels which are called the Synoptic Gospels. And I can give you examples after examples where the message of the gospel is exactly the same message which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has given, or even the terminology or the phrases or the words, they are exactly the same. And I will give you examples. We just read this morning that Jesus, peace be upon him, said, be merciful so that you can be shown mercy in the heavens. It's exactly the same thing which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Irhamu man fil ardi, yarhamukum man fil sama. Be merciful to the people of the earth so that the one who is in the heaven could be merciful to you. I just read in the morning again in the session that there is a passage in which we are told that Jesus will judge the people or God will judge the people on the day of judgment, separating the righteous from the non-righteous. To the righteous people, it will be said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you fetched me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in captivity and you came and you visited me. Now look what is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. And people will say, O oh Lord, we have never seen you hungry, thirsty, in captivity, and we have never fed you or given you water or visited you. And the answer will be, when you did it to the least one of my brethren, you did it to me. In the same manner, there is the other side of the story. To the non-righteous, it will be said, I was hungry and I asked you for food and you did not give it to me. I was thirsty, I asked you for water and you did not give it to me. I was a stranger and you did not allow me in. You did not invited me, invite me to come to be what taking the shelter in your house. And they would say the same thing, Lord, we have never seen you hungry or thirsty, and how could we feed you while you were the Lord? And the answer will be, don't you know that if you would have done to the least of my brethren, the poorest of all of my followers, you would have done it to me. Exactly the same thing in hadith where Prophet Muhammad in Hadith Qudsi narrates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Abdi maridtu wa lam ta'udni. O my servant, I got sick and you did not come to visit me. And the person will say on the day of judgment, Kayfa a'udu kama anta rabbul alameen. How could I have visited you while you are the Lord of the universe? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, don't you know that such and such of my servant got sick? 
فَلَمْ تَعُدْهُ and you did not visit him لَعُدْتَهُ if you would have visited him or her you would have, you would have found me there to some people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says عَبْدِ استسقيتك ولم تسقني I begged you for water and you did not fetch me and person will say how could I have given you water while you are the source of all the water you are the lord of the universe and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say don't you know such as my servant he asked you for water if you would have given him the water today you would have found that with me Abdi is I begged you for food and you did not give it to me. And the person will say, How could I have given you food while you are the Lord of the universe? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Don't you know such and such of my servant? He begged you for food and you did not give him the food. لو أتعمته لوجدت ذلك عندي If you would have given him the food Today you would have, you would have found it with me So the question is The message of Jesus was an egalitarian message The message of social justice Equality Human dignity Mutual respect Mutual sense of loving, caring, sharing and this is exactly the message of what? Islam. So therefore, from my perspective and from the Quranic perspective, there's no doubt that Jesus' message is nothing but what is the universal Islam. And that is what is the message given to everybody. And I'm going to draw the final parallel. There is a famous story of rich man and Lazarus. Ask anybody and they will tell you that in this story in the gospel there is a rich man and there is a person who is suffering, sick man. The sick man is neither invited to the house of the rich but he stays at the door. Whatever comes out, basically whatever it says falls out from the table, he eats. He dies and the rich man dies. Rich man goes to the hellfire and this sick person goes to paradise, kingdom of heaven. To cut the long story short, when the rich man asks God what happened, this guy has been raised to the status of Abraham, Ibrahim and I am suffering. What is the answer? The answer is, you saw him sick, you passed by, you ignored him. You, do not, you did not take care. This is the gist of the story. He did, never yelled at him, he never said, and the sick man never asked him to give the food. And I'm going to conclude it with that incident which happened in the life of Hassan Basri. He is one of the known tabi'i. One time somebody knocked at his door. It's the middle of the night, night is very dark. Somebody knocks at the door and he wakes up, picks up his sword and asks the wife, where is our money? She says, dinar or the money is over there. In one hand, he puts the dinar, money, dollars. In one hand, the sword. So the wife says, Hassan, what are you doing? Sword and money? He said, if the person who is knocking at my door means ill will, wants to kill me, I will protect myself with the sword. And if the person is needy, I will extend my hand and ask him to take whatever he wants. He knocked at the door, opened the door. What brought you here? He said, I need some help. Hassan Basri did not ask him why. What happened? Why didn't you take care of your bill? Why have you knocked at the door in the middle of the night? He extended the hand. Whatever person wanted to get, he picked it up. As soon as Hassan Basri closed the door, he sat down at the door and started crying, crying like a baby. Wife comes and says, Hassan, why are you crying? 
He said, I am crying. What will be my answer to God on the day of judgment? Wife says, you should be thankful to God that before that person even asked you what does he need, you took the money. You did not ask him how much you need. You just extended the hand and said, take whatever. But he says, this is what I do not have the answer for. Why didn't I know the suffering of my brother? Why he has to come to my door? Why didn't I go to him? Because God takes care of me and my needs wherever I am. I don't have to ask him, he takes care of me. Now he is going to treat me the way I have treated another person. I will have to go back his, at his door and then explain to him all of them, then he may extend the hand of Rahmah. So honestly, if you really want to know what Islam is, Islam is irhamu man fil ardi, yarhamukum man fil sama, be compassionate and merciful to the people of the earth, and the one in the heaven will be merciful to you. Aqulu qawli hadha, wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisaari al-muslimin, fa astaghfiru, innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim.